in this case it's the Aryan Sangha, the community of those spiritually elevated persons, those who have reached various stages of realization. Okay, so those are the supreme objects of veneration. But then in our day-to-day -day life, the persons that are considered worthy of veneration would be any kind of spiritual teachers, in the Buddhist tradition, parents, so we come to parents later, and also special objects that are considered to have some kind of special connection with the Buddha or the Dharma. For example, in Buddhist countries, what's considered worthy of veneration are stupas. Stupas are memorial shrines that often embed some relics of the Buddha or of deceased holy ones, saints. Um, and it's a regular practice to circumambulate the stupa, to bow down to it, to recite verses in the presence of the stupa. But I say that the most important object of veneration are the persons who are worthy of veneration. And the reason why it's a value to show honor to those worthy of honor is because when we do, when we show veneration and honor to such persons, it's a way of attuning our own <coughs> character to the character of those persons. It's a little bit like using, like if you have a guitar and it's out of tune and you don't have perfect pitch and you want to tune up your guitar, the way you tune it up is by taking a guitar that's imperfect, perfectly tuned up, and then you listen to each string and gradually you tune up your guitar till it matches, the strings match the, is it called the pitch? Okay, it's the pitch of the tuned up strings. <laughs> okay, so sometimes you have to tighten it, sometimes you loosen it, till you get exactly the right sound. And so we can say that our minds are out of tune. <laughs> the minds of the Buddhas, the Arahants, the Bodhisattvas, those are the ones that perfectly tuned. And so we try to honor them, venerate them. It means that we place them in our heart as the model that we try, that we try to follow, to emulate. And as we honor them with our minds and with our actions, we're gradually transforming our minds, our hearts, in the direction of those holy ones. And so this is the special benefit that comes from showing honor to those worthy of honor. So whenever like we start any Buddhist activity, we bow down to the Buddha, and then we recite the verses, Namo Tassa, homage to the blessed one, the worthy one, the perfectly enlightened one. And that way we attune our little Dhamma gathering to the ideal of supreme enlightenment represented by the Buddha. Okay, so this now should complete the discussion of the first verse. Now, the first verse in the Buddha's reply. Now we come to the second verse. Let me get it. Okay, again, I'll recite in Pali, then you can repeat each, each line after me. Okay. Pati Rupa Desa Vasocha. Pati Rupa Desa Vasocha. Pube Chakata Punyata. Pube Chakata Punyata. Ata Sama Panidita. Ata Sama Panidita. Etan Mangala Mutaman. Etam Mangalam Utamam. Okay, then the English. 
to reside in a suitable locality. To reside in a suitable locality. To have done meritorious actions in the past. To have done meritorious actions in the past. And to set oneself on the right course. And to set oneself on the right course. This is the highest blessing. This is the highest blessing. Yeah. If we look at these three, the three mangalas, the three factors of blessing included in this verse, it shows, it strikes me as having an extremely excellent balance of a number of factors that if one just looks at the verse superficially, one could just pass over that delicate balance between them. Okay, residing in a suitable locality that shows, you might call it, the supportive external conditions. Then, the meritorious, meritorious actions or deeds of the past, to have done those in the past, that shows the internal conditions that one brings over with one as part of one's past, call it the past, moral or spiritual inheritance. So this is pube, that means in the past. And then the third one is, I'm not completely happy with that translation, to have set oneself on the right course, or well, literally it's oneself, literally it's oneself right resolution or determination. So it's Forming a right resolution, forming a right determination. So this is the decisive factor operating in the present. So we have external conditions, internal condition coming from the past, and then the internal transformative factor occurring in the present. So a suitable locality, is to be living in an environment which is in some way supportive to our spiritual growth and practice. You know, if we are living in a war-torn country, very difficult to undertake a consistent spiritual practice. If we're living in conditions of extreme poverty where we have to struggle every day just for a living and sometimes don't succeed, if we're afflicted with persistent hunger, unemployment, other kinds of, of deficiencies, lack of schools, lack of infrastructure, again, it's difficult to turn one's mind to spiritual cultivation because one is just struggling to subsist at the material level. So when one has a relatively calm and peaceful external environment, um, at least a minimal satisfactory standard of living, good infrastructure, supportive infrastructure, then one could turn one's mind to spiritual cultivation. So that is a suitable locality. But even though I made some limiting conditions, I should also say that sometimes if the external conditions are very favorable in material terms, it can be a bit of a distraction from spiritual cultivation. And sometimes difficult, a difficult environment which challenges us can bring out potentials and qualities that can't unfold if we get everything that we desire and live in very comfortable circumstances. Okay, then we come to meritorious deeds coming from the past. And this is a concept which sometimes doesn't resonate so well, I find, <laughs> with <laughs> Americans who come to the Dharma, the idea of merit, because it, it's a very, very dominant idea in traditional Asian Buddhism. So people are always 
concerned about do, <laughs> doing what they take to be deeds of merit in order to acquire and accumulate merit in the hope of and that merit will bring benefits to them in the future. So this concept of merit is, you call it an aspect of the doctrine of karma, the teaching of karma. So merit is actually wholesome karma considered from the perspective of its ability to bring to us results that are, will be beneficial to ourselves and that will conduce to our progress and development in the future. And the way merit works, you know, often I have to say in traditional Asian Buddhist cultures, merit is conceived in a, sometimes in a mechanical way, a little mechanistic way, as though you bow down so many times to the Buddha, then you can go home and you have a little scorecard where you put it into your account. I did a hundred vows to the Buddha today, or I, <laughs> I made an offering to the monastery, I made a meal offering to the monastery on this day, and there were, let's see, ten monks present, so I offered to ten monks. So I, if we count seven units for one unit of merit and ten months, so I got seventy units of merit. <laughs> but actually, the meritorious deed are deeds which transform the mind. That's really the way merit works, is that it brings wholesome karma with the capacity to bring desirable results. But at the same time, it's planting certain dispositions in the mind, dispositions to such qualities as generosity towards non-harming, towards kindness and compassion towards others. And so in a way, doing meritorious deeds is like, if it's done with proper understanding, it's a little bit like building up our spiritual muscles. Like if somebody wants to become strong, then they go to a gym or to some workout place, and then they work out every day. You know, if you just go to work out once a month, it's not going to have much of an effect. But if you work out every day or several times a week, then gradually, you start off with the person who's the 98-pound weakling. I don't know if that makes any sense nowadays, but <laughs> when I was a kid, we used to have the comic books with the advertisements of a person who starts off as a 98-pound weakling, and then he's on the beach with his girlfriend, and the strong guy comes and pushes him aside and takes the girl. <laughs> then he starts to work out with this particular <laughs> method. And then he's on the beach, and he's a strong man, and he wins back his girlfriend. <laughs> so it's doing meritorious deeds is in a way like building up our inner spiritual muscles by repeated practice. And what one finds when one engages in meritorious deeds, first it has an immediate effect on one's mind. So when one practices, deep, for example, deeds of generosity, deeds of kindness towards others, helpfulness towards others, any kind of self-sacrificial deed, it gives an immediate lightness to the mind, as though we're kind of shedding off the heavy weight of selfishness and self-concern that we've been carrying around for years. Okay, so we've shed this burden of self-concern, we start to feel lightness and happiness and joyfulness in the mind. Okay, and then this joyfulness and lightness becomes part of our character. So when we become a person who's accustomed to doing meritorious deeds, one has a kind of joyful character, a light character that has a positive and uplifting influence on others.
kind of character so that well, sometimes when somebody walks into the room, then everybody feels just a couple of inches happier and lighter, even though the person hasn't done anything, hasn't said anything, but just something radiates out of that person. And what I would say is that this is the impact of the meritorious deeds of that person. So that character becomes cha changed over time. So it's a little bit like lifting up, like a big wave that lifts up all of the boats in the bay. So this is the force of this person's character lifts up the spirits of everyone that they influence. And then also it's said that accumulating merits creates the conditions for one's good intentions to come to fruition, to bring success. So when we engage in some kind of undertaking that we take to be wholesome and virtuous, naturally we want to succeed. And if you save people, some people, when they undertake some kind of virtuous project, it'll succeed. For other people, all sorts of obstacles arise. Okay, the reason, looking at this from the karmic standpoint, why do some people meet a lot of obstacles, others meet success? It can be a reflection of their past merits. That it's the merits, the wholesome karma, that is acquired by doing good for others, by being a source of benefits to others, that will come back to assist us. So when we undertake some project aimed at doing something that will be beneficial to others, then the force of those merits will clear up the obstacles and enable the project to succeed. Okay, so these are some of the benefits of merit in the past. And then also, the merits are also conducive not only to e external projects, but it's the merits that contribute to the success of our practice, of our personal practice, particularly the practice of meditation. Like some people, when they start to practice, will meet all sorts of inner obstacles. And those inner obstacles can be arising because they lack a strong enough basis or support of merits. Whereas those who have accumulated a rich foundation of merits, when they start to practice, all of the obstacles get dispelled easily and they could progress quickly and efficiently. So this is the usefulness of merits in promoting one's progress along the path. Okay, then the third blessing or factor mentioned here is what I translate as right resolution, right determination of the self. Okay, and this is the factor that I call the decisive factor in the present that transforms the inner direction of one's mind away from that which is harmful and destructive to one's own well-being and that of others towards the good. And the way right resolution works is that when we make repeated resolutions, determinations, we can even call them vows, these vows become the habitual disposition of the mind. There's a sutta where the Buddha says that whatever a person frequently thinks about, that becomes the direction of their mind. If one repeatedly thinks about say, thoughts that are governed by craving, by ill will, by harming, 
that will become the direction of the mind. If one repeatedly thinks thoughts of generosity, of kindness, of compassion, that will become the direction of the mind. And so it's our thinking that transforms, we could say that our thinking arises from our minds, our thoughts arise from our mind. But why do our minds differ so much in the kinds of thoughts that they think, in their habits, their dispositions? Why do people think in such different ways? What we would say, is sort of looking at this from the Buddhist perspective, that thoughts arise, at least many of them, from habit formation. So we've all sort of planted or created distinct habit formations, not only through the course of this life, but from the Buddha standpoint over many, many lives. And that becomes the texture of our mind. And then the thoughts arise from that very complex matrix of tendencies, dispositions, mental habits that we've created over many, many lives. Okay, so how are we to turn, strengthen our mind and turn it towards the good? The way this is done is by deliberately cultivating certain thoughts. Thoughts which are counteractive or antidotes to the particular obstacles that we are facing and thoughts that can steer the mind in the direction of the goals towards which we are aspiring. So if we want to change our minds, <laughs> it's not a matter of just, oh, I changed my mind. <laughs> you can't just change your mind by making one little change in a decision. But one has to, over and over in a sense, cultivate certain dispositions or resolutions or determinations and then those determinations, resolutions, become the direction of the mind. And I found this useful to do by taking as my own sort of template the, in Theravada Buddhism, we have ten qualities that are called paramis or paramitas. In the Northern Buddhist tradition, there are six paramitas. And so what I've done is use the ten paramis of the Theravada tradition as ways of forming resolution. So it makes the determination, may I be generous, willing to give to those in need joyfully. So that's the dana parami, and the sila parami, may I be virtuous, may my conduct always be worthy and in accordance with the spirit of the training. Then renunciation, may I have the ability to give up objects of attachment, and so on. We don't have to go through all ten of them here, but I have actually, I think I have it on this computer, Maybe I could give out the sheets both for the Southern tradition or Theravada tradition, sort of these resolutions that match the ten paramis. And then since I've been living at Chinese monasteries with followers of the Northern tradition, what I did is to make up resolutions for the six paramitas and then to fill it out to ten, adding resolutions that correspond to the four divine abodes or Brahma Viharas. So may I have a heart of loving kindness wishing to promote the well-being and happiness of others. A heart of compassion willing to take on and to alleviate the suffering of others. A heart of altruistic joy that rejoices in the good fortune of others. 
and the mind of impartiality that treats everyone equally. So, at the outset, what I su always suggest to people, don't start with all ten of them. Because <laughs> if you start with ten, it's easy to get discouraged and think, this is too much, too idealistic. But when looks over those ten, whichever list one chooses, and finds three of them that correspond either to particular weaknesses that one has, like if one tends to get angry easily, then you want to cultivate patience. If you tend to be lazy, then you want to cultivate vigor or energy. So you choose three of them and start off making that part of your regular practice. So this is part of the meditation practice. It's not just sitting and focusing on the breath, but it's bhavana, it's cultivating, developing wholesome qualities. And then what one finds, you know, if you say you tend to get angry easily and then you want to cultivate patience, so you do this three or four days, May I always be patient under all conditions, no matter how provocative they might be. <laughs> okay, then you look up sort of after four or five days, how am I doing? <laughs> Somebody yells at you, you get angry, you think, ah, oh, it's not working. <laughs> but it ain't like that. <laughs> it's not something you see the result after four or five days or even after a few weeks, but after a month, three months, a year, you really find tremendous changes are taking place. Just by reciting these formulas every day, it's sort of planting the seed in your mind and watering that seed so that it's growing stronger and stronger. Again, to you, actually, to follow through on that simile of the seed, sort of like if you plant a flower, well I don't know, but I guess flowers take a little time too, but flowers can grow rather quickly, but if you take the acorn and you want to grow an oak tree and you put it in the ground, then, you know, after a week if you look and you see, is that oak tree growing out of the acorn? You don't see anything. After a month, you might not see anything. Maybe after a few months you might see a little sprout start coming out. But if you come back a few years later, then you'll start to see that maybe the oak tree is this, this high. And that, well, oak trees grow very, very slowly, so maybe that's not a good example. <laughs> Since you might have to come back a few lives later. To see <laughs> But at least if you see the oak tree this big, you can have the confidence it's going to grow and grow and grow until over time, you know, 70 years later, <laughs> you've planted it as a little boy. Now you come back leaning on a walking stick. And you see that it's now a big oak tree, which is providing shelter for little animals and birds and so on. So in a way, that's what we're doing, is sort of cultivating these wholesome qualities. And these develop out of right resolution. That is the way we're cultivating these good qualities. So you could start with three, and then once you get three sort of firmly established, then you could add two more to get five. And then you could keep on adding little by little till maybe you get up to ten. But if you feel comfortable with stopping at three, or moving on to another three, you can do that. You just sort of experiment to find what works. But what I can guarantee is that even if you just stick with three and do it every day as part of your practice, in a year you look back, you'll see differences in yourself and other people will see differences in you.
Excuse me. Um, can you ask a question? Oh, yeah, I should actually uh, later. pause to ask people if they have questions. So please do ask a question. Um, so, so in terms of step one, step one, the right course, um, I'm very confused because the course can be absurd. Wait, please speak more loudly. Um, I have difficult understanding the right course. The right course? Yeah, because I have no idea whether it's the right course or not. Okay, okay. That, that's the, a good question. The that's, same thing at the, um, the locality. Um, yeah. The, as you said, it, it, it might be seems bad in certain ways, but finally it turns out good. Yeah. So I think for, for me, it's, I always have difficult in choosing. Difficulty. Difficulty in making this kind of decision. Okay. That's my question. I actually had a text that I wanted to show that will show some of the kinds of qualities that one wants to turn away from and the qualities that one wants to develop. It comes from a sutta. So let us take a look at that. in the supplementary text. Okay, so these are some of the kinds of what I call the right resolutions. I've taken this from, there is a sutta or discourse in the Majjhima called um, the Salaika Sutta. Yeah, so it's the number eight. And so here the Buddha is explaining well, how to form this kind of right resolution. Okay, so it starts off, interestingly, that it starts off with cruelty, that some people might be cruel, but one makes the determination, I will not be cruel. Then it goes through the actions that correspond to, the, I think it's the ten courses of, wholesome act, of unwholesome action and the ten courses of wholesome action. So killing living beings, abstaining from killing living beings. Stealing, abstaining from stealing. Since the Buddha is speaking to monks, he speaks about in terms of celibacy. Um, others will speak falsehood, we shall abstain from false speech. Others might speak maliciously, we shall abstain from malicious speech. Okay, so then it comes, to, so those are types of actions, then it goes into qualities of mind. So others might be covetous or greedy, we shall not be greedy here. Others might have ill will, then it goes to the path factors, wrong view, wrong intention, wrong speech. It said right view, right intention, right speech, right action. And then there's a, it goes through like 44 of them. So one could use this text as a basis for understanding like what is like wrong resolution, what is right resolution. Another is what I said just before about using the scheme of the paramitas, either the six paramitas or the ten paramitas. So those are qualities that are desirable fit to be developed, and so we could understand that is the right course. Any, any other questions that came up? Yeah, please. Uh, this is like a broad one. Yeah. Uh, it seems like some of the people who engage with these texts, like people more joyful and open over time, and for other people that's not so much the effect. So it's like it's so easy to listen to you 
talk about this because there's like this apparent joy mm. that comes with it. And I'm wondering, and it seems true both for lay people and also for, um, for monastics. So what is it that creates like a deepening openness uh, and joy with engagement versus like a, a rigidity or a, Sourness. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> of course, I have seen people, as you say, who engage with these texts to become rigid and sour and a bit dogmatic. I think partly it comes out of the predispositions that one brings to the text, sort of the temperament that one brings. And Maybe sometimes there's something in the tone of the text that can a little bit encourage that. <laughs> I don't know, it depends on how, just how one approaches it. I think, in my, I have to say, in my younger days as a monk, I wouldn't quite say that I was sour, but I was rather stiff and rigid. But over time, maybe it's part of the process of maturation, that I find myself sort of softening up and becoming much more flexible. You've been bringing sour, <laughs> sour <laughs> <months. laughs> uh, I'll leave that for others to judge. <laughs> so no, am I bringing sourness to the text? I said that if sometimes if environment and situations are too comfortable, too easy, too much in accord with what we want and expect, it doesn't challenge us, it doesn't sort of run up against us. And often it's those kinds of situations, those difficulties that we face that challenge us, that enable us to develop qualities that we wouldn't otherwise be able to develop. You know, so maybe it's... Like, if we get criticized a lot, that helps us to develop patience. Like, um, yes, so this would be one, one way in which um, facing situations that are disagreeable can help to bring out good qualities within us. And similarly with the environment, if everything is true. In fact, we see this in our American society, people who grow grown up in wealthy families, where they have everything that they want. These kids, the kids can get easily spoiled. And they become arrogant and complacent and demanding on others, whereas people who come up out of poorer environments, poorer families, have to you know, develop determination, strength. They also develop, are able to develop good qualities. So in a way, you know, the environment in itself is just one contributing factor, but it doesn't explain everything. There also takes place the intersection of environment with the kind of dispositions that we bring into our interactions with the environment. Okay. Yeah, please. I had a question as far as with uh, not associating with the people that are unwise or the unwise uh, situations. 
And that, that determination of how much contact, I know you spoke about having compassion yeah. and engaging, yeah. if we have that, but I also thought about the sutta, the horse trainer, sutta, yeah. where the Buddha talks about cutting off contact, if I understand it correctly. The one where he speaks about killing the horse? Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, that is, let's see if I remember the sutta. I was just wondering how that related to that. It ties to that contact with unwise. Do we cut off that contact as a Buddha spoke about killing that horse, like killing the horse or killing? If I remember, and that's Sutta, the Buddha is. Okay, he's trying to train a person. He's just, speaking to the horse trainer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The horse trainer says that he has four ways of dealing with the horse. Um, sometimes it's sort of like using the method of the whip, the other is, or the stick. The second is the method of the carrot, sort of inducing the horse to, with encouragement, to behave the way he wants. Sometimes he uses both. And then the Buddha says, what do you do if the horse just won't submit to training at all? Then the horse trainer says, in that case, then I kill him, kill the horse. And then the horse trainer asks the Buddha, how do you train a person? your disciples, then the Buddha says, I also have the same four methods. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. One method is sort of to it, spur on, create a sense of urgency in the disciple by telling him that if you engage in unwholesome action, it's going to lead to misery and suffering in the future. And then the second way is by encouraging him to do good, by pointing out the benefits of behavior, of undertaking the training. The third way is by using the combination of both methods. Then the Buddha says, uh, then the horse trainer says, and what do you do with a disciple who won't submit to any of those methods of training? Then the Buddha says, in that case, I kill him. And the horse trainer, <laughs> the horse trainer is shocked and says, certainly you, the Buddha, don't kill living beings. What do you mean? Then the Buddha says, well, if the disciple won't submit to any of these methods of training, then I myself and my elder disciples, we don't speak to him. We don't try to give him any instructions. Yes. Is so that okay a with the people that maybe are unwise? Yeah. Right, we have compassion, but I guess that's the, you know, at what point do we say that's... Yeah, I, think, I have compassion, but from afar. Yeah, you, like, you can that, be over there, like, I have compassion for you, but we're not yeah, talking. I, I don't know any hard and fast rules that can govern that kind of process. That one just has to experiment and see what works. It is a hard one. That's yeah. hard. And that monk who was criticizing all the other monks, he wasn't really a bad person. He was actually quite a good monk. It was just that particular trait of character. But if somebody tried to speak to him about it, then he would complain. <laughs> the monks that go around criticizing other monks. <laughs> Okay, maybe we could take one more question, then I think there's the time, time for the work period. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I had a question in associating um, with uh, wholesome people. So um, there was a quote, when I associate with this person, unwholesome qualities increase in me and wholesome qualities decline. Um, but what if the person um, that triggers the unwholesome qualities actually um, is someone that has all the de definitions of um, having wholesome qualities to associate with? So basically, basically say I would associate with someone wise, but um, that would trigger a lot of unwholesome qualities in me. Would I should I continue? Assuming? I think you should still continue to associate with the wise. <laughs> because it could be that the association with the wise is sort of bringing up those qualities in you, you know, as part of the process of getting rid of them. 
So now you're able, maybe that person is sort of serving as a mirror that's bringing up into your mind those characters, those qualities that have always been present, but they just haven't had the chance to, to bubble up to the surface. Okay. So you don't think that even maybe sometimes I seem to understand that karma also plays um, a sort of role into the relationships that we have with people. Yeah. Um, so perhaps it's not necessarily that the individual has right now unwholesome yeah. qualities, but it's just because of previous um, karma, yeah. karmic conditions between um, between the two of us or whatnot, that there is... Yeah, um, it could be some kind of karmic aspect of the relationship. Mm -hmm. But still, as long as one could see that person as admirable and has being endowed with those good qualities, good qualities, then one should continue to associate with them and then show that person the proper sort of reverence and then those qualities will start to sort of seep into you. That's my, my opinion. Thank you. Okay. I just okay. want to say very quickly, I adore the metaphor of the elephant, the untamed elephant and the tamed elephant. Yeah. I mean, it, it, to me it just resonates and it rings very true. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's just really something that I needed to hear as, as something as it relates to association mm -hmm. you know, and, and becoming more immersed uh, with people who are wise. So yeah. I just want to thank you for that. Yeah, and if you want to know the source for that, I think it's in the Majjhima Nikaya it might be sutta number 125. <laughs> 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 it's called the, the, well, it could be rephrased, the title, Dantabhumi Sutta, the stage of the tamed. It sort of uses the process of taming an elephant. The Buddha uses that as the simile for the process of taming a person who is newly entered upon a monastic life. Okay, we break for the 